Chapter 13 The house was very quiet next morning when Miriam made her way to Felicite's room. It was almost noon. Even allowing for the scandalous hour they'd come in, Felicite could not possibly still be asleep. The silence of the hall, however, encouraged the uneasy doubts that had been nibbling at the edge of her pleasure. It reminded her of the utter silence in which the four women had ridden home last night, a silence which, at the time, she had been far too enraptured to heed. She knocked on Felicite's door, and then, as always, opened it and peeked inside. "'Go away!' ordered Felicite. "'I have a headache. I don't want to see anyone.' Miriam shut the door. Across the hallway, Hortense, with an untouched breakfast tray, was just emerging from Madame's chamber, and from the twinkle in her eye, Miriam saw that she had overheard. "'Mademoiselle is out of sorts this morning?' whispered Hortense. "'Are you surprised?' Miriam did not answer. She wanted to stay wrapped in her rosy dream, but even more she wanted to talk to someone, so she tiptoed down the stairs after Hortense, through the quiet rooms, into the familiar kitchen. "'Why shouldn't I be surprised?' she demanded, when it was safe to speak out loud. "'Oh, stop pretending, Miriam. Sometimes lately you sound just like Felicité. Did you think we would not all know how Madame is very angry?' "'She did act queerly last night,' Miriam admitted. "'I guess I wasn't paying much attention. Maybe you should pay attention. Lucille, she helped Madame undress last night, and she told us the whole thing. Such a to-do. Madame, she was raging at everyone. She even slapped Lucille for breaking a drawstring.' She swore she'd send you and your sister back to the Indians this morning. Felicité was crying her pretty eyes out. Monsieur, he finally got them quieted down, but Lucille said Madame would surely like to scratch your eyes out. But why, Hortense? Madame invited us. She gave us the dresses. Was it wrong that I had a good time? Did she expect that no one would dance with me? She never expected what happened, that's certain. According to her, you made eyes at every man there. And those old gowns? You fixed them up so they look better than the brand new ones. Madame says you did it on purpose to humiliate her. The idea! I did no such thing. No? Don't cry at me. I'm just telling you what I heard. Madame said you put on airs like the Queen of France. Miriam, you know what is really the matter? You think we have not heard that too? You think we don't know about the handsome Pierre Laroche? Maybe you know more than I do, Miriam answered crossly. Go ahead, what did they say? Felicité said he danced with you seven times, and when he was dancing with the others, he looked at you and didn't hear what anyone said. You think Felicité would like that? But Felicité has so many bows. What difference would just one make? Do you think she's in love with him, Hortense? Oh, love, Hortense shrugged her shoulders. What does Felicité know about love? It is Madame, Pierre Laroche, so rich, so handsome. All the Bamans have an eye on Pierre for a long time. You think they would enjoy it that an English girl walks off with him right under their noses? I didn't walk off with him. He just kept coming back. He... Oh, Hortense, everything happened so fast. It was so exciting, and it never stopped to think. Oh, dear. If I spoiled the party for Felicité, I'm sorry. Very sorry? prodded Hortense, with such a shrewd twinkle that Miriam had to laugh. Suddenly, looking at each other, both girls were overtaken by helpless giggles, just as in the early days together. They clung to each other, weak with laughter. All the same, I'm scared now, said Miriam finally, wiping her eyes. What do you think I ought to do? Apologize to Madame. I think you should stay well out of Madame's way for a day or two. May I stay down here with you? Hortense clapped a hand over her mouth. Peste! I forgot Madame wanted an ice pack for her forehead. Come back later, Miriam. If you like, we can walk to the baker's together. Miriam was still suppressing a giggle as she climbed the stairs to her own chamber. Though her conscience did prick her, the joke was too delicious not to relish. She hurried to pour out every detail to a sober Susanna, who found nothing amusing in the recital. "'Tis very unfortunate,' Susanna shook her head. "'I should never have consented to our going. This is a shameful way to have repaid Madame's kindness.' "'Don't preach, Susanna. Madame hasn't a drop of kindness in her, and you know it. She treats us as though we were Indians. All that generosity is only a pose before her friends. If it weren't for James' agreement with Monsieur, you'd have been put to work in the kitchen the way I was. It would have been more fitting than all this foolishness. You needn't sound so righteous. You enjoyed it as much as I did, Every time I looked at you last night, you were having the time of your life. Susanna flushed. I admit, I did enjoy it, she confessed. I'm ashamed to think of it now. I'm not blaming you, Miriam. You're young, and it was all new to you. But that I should have forgotten myself. And with James gone so long. Susanna buried her face in her hands. 
You can't blame yourself either. You didn't even dance. All you did was forget to act solemn for once. Besides, no one would have minded if it hadn't been for Pierre. Susanna raised her head. That young courier? Miriam, you wouldn't... I mean, a traitor like that? He's not a proper person at all. Miriam laughed. You don't need to worry. Madame will make sure I never lay eyes on him again. But you must admit, it was exciting. Susanna shook her head. It was not worth it. Besides, there's more to this than just what happened last night. I've been expecting trouble for weeks. James has been gone too long. We knew he could not make it in two months. They could not expect it. I'm sure he's all right, Susanna. I pray so. I make myself believe that he is. But will these French people be so patient? I suppose we can only go on waiting. Waiting was a task poorly suited to Miriam's nature. For the next three days Felicite sulked in her room, tripped haughtily past on the way to the door, and refused to meet Miriam's eye at the dinner table. Madame also behaved as though the two English women were invisible. When the hours dragged in the quiet bedchamber, Miriam went in search of Hortense. Early the fourth afternoon a servant knocked at the door with word that Madame Johnson was to come to the drawing-room at once. "'Shall I go with you?' Miriam asked. "'Tis not fair for you to have to face Madame all alone. There was no mention of you. Never fear, I am quite capable of facing Madame by myself. No doubt of that, Miriam admitted. You're a match for a dozen of her any day. But I'm sorry you have to suffer for what I've done. Truly I am. As the minutes dragged by, Miriam would far rather have been with Susanna, facing the most blasting storm, than waiting in this quiet room. What could be taking so long? Captive, as though she sensed that something was amiss, was unusually peevish. More than an hour had passed before the door opened, and Susanna came slowly into the room, dropped into a chair, and covered her face with her hands. "'What is it?' Miriam demanded. "'Tell me, what could they have said to you?' "'We are to leave this house,' Susanna said painfully. "'They will not have us here another night.' "'Why, Susanna? Just because of those silly dresses?' "'No. I told you that was only part of it. They think James has broken his bond. The two Indians came back a week ago. They say they left James in Albany early in December, and he was well and strong. Thank God for that, at least. He had to go on to Boston to get the money. They waited seven weeks, but he never came back. Monsieur de Cresse says he never intended to come back, that it was all just a trick to get his freedom. My James, who never broke his word to anyone in his life. Do you think he could not get the money? Other families have been redeemed. Perhaps he fell ill. Perhaps he is even... Susanna! That is not like you at all. I'm sure he is on the way right now. The Indians reported there is fighting breaking out everywhere. I doubt he could get through now. James will get through somehow. You know he will. They just have to give us more time. The time has run out. I pleaded with him, Miriam, as though I had no pride at all and he would not even listen. Tis Madame who's behind it, the hateful thing. I know she has nagged him into it. Perhaps. But there is the money, too. They didn't take us in out of charity, remember. You have always forgotten that we were prisoners. Miriam thought for a moment. There was a solution, and she must face it, without even letting Susanna know how much it would cost. We can work here, she managed to say. We can be servants the way I was before you came. Susanna dismissed this heroic gesture. I asked him that, too. They will not have us in the house. That much, at least, is the other night's doing. Tears rolled down Miriam's cheeks. It is all my fault. I knew it. Susanna reached a comforting hand. Don't take on, Miriam. I have wondered how long they would keep us. Now help me get ready before they find us still here. But how could we carry things out? I shall take nothing, said Susanna, except the dress they gave me at the fort that first day. That was given me freely without thought of any return. Nor shall you, Miriam. That homespun dress you had on the day I came here will be sufficient. That plain old thing? You can't mean it. Why, well, that's what the habitants wear. Susanna turned a stern eye. And what are we? Better than habitants? They are self-respecting people, like our neighbors at home. But all those beautiful things. I can't leave them behind. No one wants them. They were loaned to you, not given. Monsieur de Crest said outright that we already owe him more than we could hope to repay in years. Miriam, he even threatened to put us in jail as debtors. He wouldn't dare. He only said that to scare you. He meant it. I'm so afraid of the jail, Miriam. Better if we'd never left St. Francis. Miriam's defiance crumpled. She climbed glumly into the homespun dress. Do we leave behind these fine, moth-eaten cloaks with fur falling off in patches? We shall have to have cloaks, decided Susanna, not heeding her sister's sarcasm. 
The baby will have to have blankets, too, poor little thing. Now, that is all. Come quickly. Susanna wrapped the baby warmly, and captive, delighted to be going anywhere, smiled up into her mother's worried face. Her happy chirruping was the only sound as they left the pretty room and made their way down the stairs into the snowy street. Once outside, Susanna's determination suddenly petered out, and she leaned weakly against the wall. I was in such a haste to be rid of that place. Now I don't know where to turn. Where do you think we could find work, Miriam? Do you think the mayor's wife, Miriam ventured, she might let you take care of Polly? The quick spark of hope in Susanna's eyes died away. No chance of that. The woman will never let me lay eyes on my child if she can help it. No. We have had enough of the fine folks. If we're to find work, it will have to be with our own kind. Then we'll try the shops, Miriam decided. There is one where I bought thread. That woman was friendly. They were thoroughly chilled by the time they had made their way down the hill to the Rue de St. Paul, and they thankfully entered the steamy warmth of the shop. But the woman's friendly smile died away at their first words. Work? But certainly not. Do you think I cannot care for this little shop by myself? What could I want with two women and a baby? What would anyone want with two strange women and a baby? It was not only indifference they met from shop to shop, but a definite hostility which struck as coldly to their spirits as the biting winds they had to return to time after time. When finally they stopped and huddled close to a wall for warmth, Miriam met Susanna's eyes over the bundle of blanket and saw there a reflection of the panic that was rising in her like a sickness. Those soldiers, she shuddered, they have passed us three times now. I don't like the way they looked at us. Susanna bit her lip. We must keep moving, or they will suspect we have nowhere to go. For all we know, they may have orders to put us in jail. It was fast growing dark. Captive, cold and ravenous, set up a piercing wail that could not be quieted. Hurrying down the alleyway, Miriam glanced behind and saw a dark figure following them. Her heart sank, and then all at once bounded with relief. It was not a soldier pursuing them, but Hortense. As she came nearer, her anxious round face broke into smiling wrinkles. Thank goodness! I thought I would never find you. For hours I have looked. Miriam, why did you go without telling me? Oh, Hortense, you mean you have come all this way in the cold just to say goodbye? But certainly not goodbye, said Hortense in amazement. I have come to take you home. Home? Back to the Ducrests? To my family's house? It is not too far, just outside the city. Miriam felt a hot sting of tears against her eyelids. But Susanna stared at the French girl doubtfully. You are very kind, she said, but we need to find work. Perhaps you know someone who would hire us. Hire? You mean pay you wages? asked Hortense incredulously. But who would pay wages to the English? So the enmity in these people's faces had not been imagination. Didn't you know? she went on, seeing their shocked faces. Up there on the hill, you did not think about the war, no? But down here, we know there is a war. You think it is safe for two English women to be wandering about on the street? Susanna, her face pinched with cold and despair, could not seem to make up her mind. Hortense stamped her snowy boots impatiently. Allons, we can't stand here. Give me the baby. She is a heavy one, that captive. She started briskly down the street, and they had no choice but to follow. But Hortense, protested Miriam, almost running to keep up. If people feel like that, what will your family think? If we are enemies, that is different, answered Hortense over her shoulder. You are not my enemy. You are my friend, n'est-ce pas? Inside. Go away, ordered Felicite. I have a headache. I don't want to see anyone. Miriam shut the door. Across the hallway, Hortense, with an untouched breakfast tray, was just emerging from Madame's chamber, and from the twinkle in her eye, Miriam saw that she had overheard. Mademoiselle is out of sorts this morning, whispered Hortense, who could not possibly still be asleep. The silence of the hall, however, encouraged the uneasy doubts that had been nibbling at the edge of her pleasure. It reminded her of the utter silence in which the four women had ridden home last night, a silence which, at the time, she had been far too enraptured to heed. She knocked on Felicite's door, and then, as always, opened it and peeked in. Are you surprised? Miriam did not answer. She wanted to stay wrapped in her rosy dream, but even more she wanted to talk to someone, so she tiptoed down the stairs after Hortense, through the quiet rooms, into the familiar kitchen. Why shouldn't I be surprised? she demanded, when it was safe to speak out loud. Oh, stop pretending, Miriam. 
Sometimes lately you sound just like Frisette. Did you think we would not all know how Madame is very angry? She did act queerly last night, Miriam admitted. I guess I wasn't paying much attention. Maybe you should pay attention. Lucille, she helped Madame undress last night, and she told us the whole thing. Such a to-do. Madame, she was raging at everyone. She even slapped Lucille for breaking a drawstring. Chapter 13 The house was very quiet next morning when Miriam made her way to Felicite's room. It was almost noon. Even allowing for the scandalous hour they'd come in, Felicite 